very different from the world of Francis and the world of theoretical computer science and in particular algorithm on strings. And I would like to speak about one of the most fundamental problems in this area, the problem of pattern matching. And I will explain how probability has changed the landscape of this problem in the recent years. And what uh, I will try to present some open problems as well. So you've probably seen this problem at least once during the basic algorithms course, but just in case I will remind you what the problem is. So we are given a pattern which is usually a short string of length m. Let's fix the length of the string to m. And let's fix, uh, I will say that p is always the pattern. And we also have a long string, t, which is usually called a text. And let's fix its length to n. And what we must do, we must output all positions i in the text, such that for some j between 1 and i, there is a substring tgi, which is close to p. It's up to us to define what close is. So here you can see this uh, text t, which is a long string. And you can see that this sub uh, substring c, a, a, b, c is kind of close to b, c, a, a, c. It resembles the pattern. Then you can see that this substring b, c, a, 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 c is actually equal to the pattern, which is, of course, close. And then you can see that this substring is a, c, a, 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 c is always also close to the pattern. So let's formalize what close is. Of course, if they are equal, the pattern is equal to the substring, they are close. But we can always also define the notion of closeness with regards to the Hamming distance and the added distance, two of the most classical distances in the area of string algorithms. So what is the Hamming distance? The Hamming distance is always defined on strings of equal length. And it's the number of mismatches between the two strings. So here you have two words, two strings, ser and sel. And the Hamming distance between them is two, the number of mismatches between them. And the added distance is the number of insertions, deletions, and substitutions that you need in order to transform the first string into the second string. So here you have a string bora bora and a string barok. And the added distance between them is four because what you can do, you can replace the first O in bora bora with A. And then you can delete the three last letters of bora bora in order to obtain barok. And you cannot do less than four added operations. Okay? So, let me now formalize the three variants of pattern matching that I would like to discuss today. The first one is the exact pattern matching when we are looking for substrings that are equal to the pattern. The second one is the chemist match pattern matching when we are looking for the substrings that are at Hamming distance at most k from the pattern. And the last one is the k-added pattern matching when we are looking at substrings that are at added distance at most k from the pattern. Okay? So before I go to the algorithms themselves, I would like to present two toy applications for those of you who are more on the practical side. The first application uh, comes from astronomy. And actually, it's uh, connected to a discovery that was done by Jocelyn Bell Bergnall and her supervisor, Anthony Hewish. In 1968, they found a very strange, very periodic signal coming from the space. And at first, they thought that, oh, maybe this is aliens trying to contact in us. Uh, and of course, very soon they understood that this was not, not the case, but it was a very important discovery. It was a discovery, the first experimental observation of a pulsar, a rotating star that emits uh, some electromagnetic radiation of its magnetic poles. And pulsars are actually very important in astronomy, and it's very important to be able to detect these periodicities in signals. And this is what you can do with pattern matching. I will not be able to explain how in this talk, but you can do this efficiently. And the second talk, uh, the second application comes from bioinformatics. You might know that current bioinformatics methods, when they sequence a biological sequence, they do not actually try to output the sequence in a whole, because this is very expensive. What they try to do instead, they try to chop the sequence, uh, the molecule, into small pieces called reads, and then they assemble these reads into one sequence using computational methods. And how they do that? Well, they use the fact that if you have two species that are relatively close to each other, then their genomes are very close to each other as well. So they take one genome, which they call the reference genome, and they try to map the reads from the other genome onto the reference genome. And that allows them to understand what the order between the reads is, and then they glue the reads together, right? 
So this can be formalized as multiple pattern matching under the added distance, for example. Okay? So I hope that I convinced both sides of you, the theoretical side and the practical side, that this is an important problem. And our goal for today will be to discuss how can we develop a small space algorithm for one of these three variants of the pattern matching. And we will consider a particular restrictive streaming setting, which was first formalized in 1999 by Alice Martin and Stagetti. What is the definition of the streaming setting? The definition is that the input comes as a stream, one data item at a time, you can usually make only one pass over the data and you must answer the query that, uh, that you have. You prefer to use, so the goal is to use very small memory, generally logarithmic in the size of the stream and ideally very little pre processing time per data item. So let's see what we can do for pattern matching. Unfortunately, if we are deterministic and I will show you it a little bit later, we must use omega of m space. We must use space which is linear in the size of the pattern. We cannot do better. But if we allow for probability, we can do better. Okay, and this will be the goal of my talk. So in the technical part of my talk, there will be three parts. I will first speak about the exact pattern matching, then about the KMS match pattern matching, and then on top of that, I will explain you what we can do of the K edit pattern matching. At least let's try to do. Let's start from the exact pattern matching. So once again, this is the problem. I first receive the pattern as a stream. I can preprocess it. I can memorize something about it. I have to account for all the space I use to remember the information that I store about the pattern. Then I receive the text letter by letter. And every time I receive a new letter, I must say whether there is a substring ending at this letter that is equal to the pattern. So here, for example, I say no because the substring CAA, BCA is different from the pattern. Then I say no, 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 yes, and no again. Okay, so this is my problem. Let us first show that if we are deterministic, we must use omega of m space. For simplicity, let's assume the binary alphabet and let's assume that the length of the text n is equal to the length of the pattern m. So what we have, there are two to the m different patterns, right? And assume that we use less than m bits of memory. What does it mean? It means that there are two patterns, P1, which is different from P2, for which the states of the memory are different after reading them, all right? So let's run two instances of, of the algorithm. One for P1 and the text which is equal to P1, and the second for P2 and the text which is equal to P1. What is the output of the algorithm after reading T? The first instance must say yes, right? Because P1 is equal to the text in the first instance. And the second instance must say no. But this is impossible because after reading P1, we are, uh, after reading the pattern, we are in the same state of memory. And then we read the text, which is the same for both instances. So a contradiction, we must use at least m bits of memory. Okay? We must be, so in the deterministic case, we cannot do better than omega of m bits of memory. So let's see what, what we can do if we are probabilistic. And when I say probabilistic pattern matching, you probably remember about one algorithm, you probably have heard about it, the algorithm of Cup and Rabin. Okay, but just to remind you, this is a very old algorithm, it's from an algorithm from, from 1977. So just to remind you what the algorithm is about, it uses a hash function. The hash function is called the cup rabin fingerprint. And it's defined in a very simple way. If I give you a string S1, S2, Sm, it's equal to this expression, Si times R to the, uh, to the power M minus I modulo P, where P is a prime and R is a random remainder modulo P. It can be considered as uh, the value of a polynomial with coefficients equal to the letters of the string on a random remainder in FP, okay? So what is good about this hash function? First, if you have two strings and they are equal, then the hash values are equal as well. This is easy to see. But also if we choose P, which is big enough, and the strings are different, then their fingerprints will be different with high probability. And there is one more property which will be very important to us. It is that this fingerprint is concatenatable. 
What does it mean? It means that if you have two strings, x, y, and I give you two of the fing fingerprints of x, y, and their concatenation x, y, then you'll be able to compute the third fingerprint efficiently, okay? And I ask you to memorize this property. So this is one of the important properties of these fingerprints. I give you a fingerprint of x and y, you can compute the fingerprint of x, y efficiently. I give you the fingerprint of x and the fingerprint of x, y, you can compute the fingerprint of y efficiently, okay? So let's see how we can use this. A very simple algorithm of cup and rubbing. So what can we do? We can compute the cup rubbing fingerprint of the pattern and then the fingerprint of every m length substring of the text. And if we see that the fingerprint of the pattern is equal to the fingerprint of a substring, then we say, yes, there is an occurrence. And because the collision probability is small, our algorithm is correct with high probability, okay? But let's see now how we can implement that. We need to compute the fingerprints of the substrings, right? Let's see how we can do this and whether we can do this efficiently. So what we can do for that? First, we can compute the fingerprint of the first m led substring. And that we, we can do in bigger O of m time. And now we compute the fingerprints of the remaining substrings one by one. And for that, we can use the following formula. If I ask you to compute the fingerprint of the m length substring that ends at the position t, it can be computed from the fingerprint of the m length substring that ends at the position t minus one using just a constant number of arithmetic operations. So it can be computed in constant time. So in total, the algorithm of Cup and Rubin can compute all the fingerprints of all the substrings, of all m length substrings, using big O of n time. It's a linear time algorithm, very efficient in terms of time. But let's now think about how much space we must use. So this algorithm, the algorithm of Cup and Rubin, it can be considered as a streaming algorithm because we can compute the fingerprints as we read, as we receive the text. But unfortunately, in order to implement this formula, we need to know t, t minus m, a letter that arrived m letters ago. And it means that at every moment of the algorithm, we must know the m last letters of the text. We must use omega of m space. So yes, it's a streaming algorithm, but in terms of space, it's not very efficient. Can we do better? Yes, we can. And this is very surprising, and uh, it first was shown almost 30 years after the algorithm of Cup and Rubin. It was shown in Porat and Porat that there is a streaming algorithm for exact pattern matching, which uses log m space and log m time per letter of the text. It was then improved a little bit in terms of time uh, by Breslau and Galil. And then we also showed some generalizations for a dictionary of deep patterns when you have deep patterns. We showed that we can do better than just running the algorithm for one pattern d times. And right now I want to give you one open question which is very annoying for my community. So maybe you'll be able to help us to find the answer. So here you can see that the algorithm uses log m space, and this is space in terms of words. So in terms of bits, it's log squared m bits. The only low bound that we know is omega of log m. We don't know where the right answer is. Okay, so I hope that uh, we can go further. Let me show you some ideas uh, behind the algorithm of Porat and Porat. And one of the most important bricks in the solution is the simple lemma, which is the corollary of uh, Fine and Wilf periodicity lemma from, I don't remember when, very far ago in time. So assume that you have two strings, y and x, and the length of y is not too different from x. So you have only two possibilities. Either the number of occurrences of x and y is small, one or two, or you have very regular structure of these occurrences. You actually have that the occurrences form an arithmetic progression. Arithmetic progressions are good because you can store an arithmetic progression using constant amount of space. You only need to store the first occurrence and the difference, right? 
Okay, and this is another brick that I ask you to memorize. It will be important for us. So now the algorithm of for it and for it. What you do, you actually do something stupid. Okay, you take every position of the text, and first you check whether it's an occurrence of the of the prefix of the pattern of length one. Then you take this position and you check whether it's an occurrence of the prefix of length two. Then you take the same position and you test whether it's an occurrence of the prefix of length four, and so on. Okay, so you consider all the prefixes of power of two length. So it seems first that you do more work than in uh, the algorithm of cup and rubbing. But let's see how this is beneficial for us. So what we do, we store log m levels of occurrences of the prefixes of the patterns of length power of two, okay? And when a new letter ti arrives, we first check whether it's equal to p1, the prefix of length one. If it is, we push this position to level zero, okay? And then we consider every level of occurrences in turn, and we consider oops, the left most occurrence in every level. If the distance from this occurrence to the end of the text is equal to the length of the next prefix, we test whether it's an occurrence of the next prefix of the pattern. And if it is, we promote the occurrence to the next level, and otherwise we discard it. Okay, so it's easy to see that the algorithm is actually, oops, correct, because what we do, we test every position log m times, and if it is an occurrence of the pattern, it must test, it must pass all the tests. We don't have any <coughs> doubts about that, okay? But uh, let's see if we can do it efficiently. So what is important to see here is that in every level, we only store occurrences that are not far away from the end of the text. So if I'm in level i, if I consider occurrences of the prefix of level two to of length two to the i, that I'm only interested in occurrences at distances at most two to the i plus one from the end of the text. Because if they are further away, I either promote them to the next level or discard them. But what does it mean? It means that the lemma, the structural lemma that I showed you before, it comes into play. In every level, I will have an arithmetic progression of occurrences, okay? And that means that occurrences in every level can be stored using very little space, constant space. It's an arithmetic progression. Mm -hmm. It also means that I can actually test them efficiently. And I'm not gonna explain how I do it exactly, but I claim that it is enough to store two fingerprints per level. And then the structure comes into play and allows me to test every occurrence efficiently. It allows me to test whether it's an occurrence of the next prefix in constant time. Okay, so all in all, it gives me per level constant space and constant time for updating uh, the next, uh, for updating the occurrences. So in total, I need log m space and log m time per character. And the algorithm is correct with high probability, which comes from the collision probability of cup rubbing fingerprints. All right? So if you don't have any questions, I will go to the next part of my talk, the K-mismatch pattern matching. Okay? So in the K-mismatch pattern matching, once again, I first receive the pattern as a stream. I can memorize whatever I want about the pattern, but I must account for everything, okay, for all the space that I use. And then I receive the text letter by letter. And at every position of my text, I must tell what is the distance, the Hamming distance between the pattern and the text, if it is at most k. And otherwise, I can simply say no, the distance is too large, okay? So this is my setting. And the Hamming distance, once again, is the number of mismatches between two strings. So what can I do for this problem? First, let me show you once again that in the deterministic setting, we are doomed. We cannot do better than linear space. So again, I assume the binary alphabet, and I assume that the length of the text is equal to the length of the pattern. There are two to the m different patterns. If I use smaller than m minus log m plus two bits of memory, it means that there are m plus two patterns for which the state of the memory is the same after I have read it. 
So now what I can do, I can run the algorithm for each of the patterns and the text equal to P1. But there are M plus one strings at the Hamming distance at most one from T. So it means that for one of the patterns, the answer must be different. But this is impossible, a contradiction, okay? So we must allow for probability if we want to achieve sublinear space. And this is what we know for the k mismatch pattern matching. So once again, here I have all the space used by the algorithm. It all started from the same seminal paper of Porat and Porat in Fox 2009. They showed an algorithm with a k cube space. Here you, you can see the small tilde. It means that there are many, many logar logarithmic factors hidden. Well, actually here there are lots of uh, logarithmic factors hidden. Here there are not so many on the two, but anyways. Uh, so in Porat and Porat, they showed an algorithm with k cube space and k squared time per letter. Then we improved it a little bit to k squared space and square root of k time per letter. Uh, in ICALP 2018, Golan et al. showed an algorithm with k space and k time per letter. Finally, in SODA 19, they showed an algorithm with k time and square root of k time per letter. And then there was two more papers one that showed some trade-off between the space and time complexity, and then we also showed an algorithm for a dictionary of deep patterns. But let me now you show some ideas behind the algorithm of Porat and Porat, and the current best algorithm uh, by Clifford, Kochimaka, and Porat. All right? So let's start from the algorithm of Porat and Porat, and let me start from a puzzle. Assume that I give you two strings, and I ask you a very simple question. Is the Hamming distance between these two strings one? Okay, so how can you answer the question? I don't want to scan the two strings, okay? Of course I can do that, but I don't want to do that. I want to, do, I want to have something more efficient. So what I can do instead, I can partition the two strings into substrings. So here I partition the upper string into three strings, the green one, A, 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 the purple red one, B, C, B, B, and the white one, A, B, A, B, okay? And I do the same for the second string. So now, obviously, if I have exactly one mismatch between these two strings, then exactly one pair of substrings will not match, okay? And my hope is that if there are at least two mismatches, then I will have two pairs of substrings that do not match. And I hope that this will allow me to distinguish between the two cases, all right? So let's see if we can implement this whole. So what we will do, we will take every prime between log m and log squared m. We will partition string one into q equispaced substrings. And we will do the same for string two. So in total, by the prime number theorem, there are log m primes and for each prime, there are log squared m pairs of substrings, okay? The magnitude of Q. So now, a lemma. If there are at least two mismatches, then there is a prime Q among those that we selected, such that at least two pairs of substrings do not match. Why this is the case? Well, if I have two mismatches, this cross one and cross two, and they, they are in the same pair of substrings. The, subs, the substrings are equispaced. It means that I select every qth letter into a substring. So if the mismatches are in the same pair of substrings, then the distance between the mismatches is a multiple of q. At the same time, the distance between the mismatches is at most m, the length of the substrings. But how many different prime divisors can a number, which is at most m, have? At most log m, right? So if I choose many enough primes, I have this, this guarantee that for, for at least one of them, the mismatches will end up in two different pairs of substrings. How can I use this to develop an algorithm for one mismatch pattern matching? Well, for each position of the text, for each prime q between log m and log squared m, I compute the number of mismatching substream, subtext, subpattern pairs. 
If this number is zero or bigger than one, I return yes, the hem, uh, I re sorry, I return no, the Hammond distance between the pattern and the text is, to, is not equal to one. And otherwise, I return yes. Okay, is the algorithm clear? So now what, it re what remains to do, it remains me to explain you how we compute this H, the number of substream, subtext, and sub patterns that do not match. And well, for that, I use the exact pattern matching algorithm, right? So uh, for each prime Q in the interval, for each subtext and sub pattern, I run this streaming exact pattern matching algorithm that I've explained to you before. And I can, can compute the number H, which allows me to decide whether the Hamming distance is, exact, exact, is exactly one. Okay, so what does it give me in terms of space and time? I have log m primes, I have log squared m substrings, I have, sorry, log squared m subtexts, I have log squared m sub patterns, and for each instance of the algorithm, I use log m memory. So in total, I use log to the six m space for this algorithm. Like I said, there are many, many logs that are hidden, okay? And the time is log m times log squared m times log squared m. So you can see that for one mismatch pattern matching, I have a polylog m space polylog m time algorithm. And if you want to solve the k mismatch pattern matching, well, you do essentially the same trick, but you use primes that are bigger. Okay, and now let me show you the algorithm. I promised you the current, to show you some ideas behind the current best algorithm by Clifford, Kochimaka and Porat. And the idea is actually quite different. They do not use this partitioning into sub patterns, subtext. What they do instead, they redefine the k-mismatch sketch. They consider the k-mismatch sketch of a string, which is defined as a tuple consisting of the Karp-Rabin fingerprint, the one that we have seen before, and also these expressions of the form sum of SIs, the letters of a string S, modular P, sum of SIs times I to the one modular P, etc. sum of SIs times I to the 2K modular P. Once again, P is the prime and R is a random remainder modular P. So what can you do uh, with the sketch? Let's, see the, uh, let's say that you have two strings, S, T, and you want to decide whether the Hamming distance between S and T is at most K. And let's assume for a second that you have K prime mismatches between these two strings in positions x1, x2, xk prime, and k prime is at most k. So now what you can do, you can consider the difference of this form. I don't know how to pronounce this letter. Phi zero, let it be phi, okay? Uh, phi zero s minus phi zero t, phi one s minus phi one t, phi two k s minus phi two k t. And what you obtain, you obtain equations of this form. And actually it turns out that this set of equations is very similar to those appearing in the decoding procedures for read Salomon codes, something coming from error correcting. And one can use the techniques from 1980s to find x1, x2, xk prime. And then you can use the Kaprabin fingerprints to verify whether your solution is actually correct. Okay? How can you use these sketches to develop a, an efficient streaming k mismatch pattern matching algorithm. Well, it turns out that this sketch is very nice. It's concatenatable. You remember I told you the cup rabin fingerprint is concatenable, which means that if I give you the fingerprint of x and the fingerprint of y, you can compute the fingerprint of x, y efficiently. Well, the same holds for this k mismatch pattern uh, k mismatch sketch, mm -hmm. the sketch for the Hammond distance. And this allowed them to use the exactly same structure Porat and Porat used for the exact pattern matching algorithm, the one where we, you consider the prefixes of exponentially increasing lengths. Okay? And uh, just by plugging these newly developed sketches for the Hammond distance into this exponentially increasing prefixes idea, they obtained an algorithm with k space and k time per letter. I don't know if you remember, the actual complexity is uh, square root of k time per letter. And they, they had to spend, uh, they had to put a lot of effort from going 
uh, from k to square root of k, but uh, I will hide this under the carpet. Right? Do you have any questions about this part? Okay, let's continue to the added distance part then. And uh, unfortunately, the added distance, usually when you speak about the added distance, it's uh, even more complicated than the Hammer distance. But uh, I will try to show you some ideas nevertheless. So the setting is, first I receive the pattern, then the text as a stream, and I must find all positions in the text where there is some, some substring ending at this position, such that the added distance from the pattern to the text is at most k. Okay, this is my task. So once again, I won't go through, through the cal calculations again, but you can show an omega of m space low bounds for this problem if you are in the deterministic setting. So if you want to achieve something sublinear in space, you must use probability. And let's see what you can do. The number of results is uh, a little bit smaller than for the Hammond distance. Uh, first, I showed an algorithm with square root of m and poly k space and square root of m and poly k time per letter. Not fancy, but it was uh, the first sublinear space algorithm for this problem. Then we improved it to k to the 5 space and poly k time per letter. And finally, in iCalc 2023, Khateri and Kutsky improved it to k squared space and k squared time per letter. So the main challenge is that for the added distance, we do not know whether there is a concatenatable sketch. Okay, so there is one for the exact case, there is one for the Hammond distance. For the added distance, we don't know. But still, we know something, and this is what we know. Uh, the first sketch for the added distance was shown by Beluzugi and Zhang in Fox 2016. They showed a sketch with k to the 8 space and poly k time. The time is the time for decoding the added distance, so I, I give you the sketches of the two strings. And now you need to spend some time in order to compute the added distance between them. And this time that you can see this here in the second column is the time that we need for computing the added distance from the sketches. Then it was improved by Jean, Nelson, and Wu to k cubed space and poly k time. Then we improved it further to k squared space k cubed time. And finally, Hatachari and Kutsky in Stock 2023 showed a sketch with k squared space and k squared time. So the first three sketches used the same idea of a random walk embedding, which I will show you just in a second. And this one uses a very different idea of locally consistent string, string parsing. We still don't know what are the best space-time uh, bounds are. So let me start from the random walk embedding. What is that? So um, the random walk embedding can, see, can be seen as a walk on a string. So you always walk from the, sorry, from the left to the right but you can stop on some letters. Mm -hmm. You can pause on some letters. And uh, there are hash functions that allow you, uh, that tell you whether you should pause at the current letter or you continue further. So we have three n random hash functions, a, g, from 0, 1 to 0, 1. And now we copy the letters of x to its embedding mu of x. We start from the first letter of x, we copy it to the embedding, and now we check what is uh, the value of the first hash function on this letter. So h1 of 0 is equal to 0. It means that we pause on the first level of uh, x and we copy it again to the embedding. Now we check what is the value of the second hash function on, the, on this letter. It's 1, so it means that we advance one position to the right and so on. And we stop when we reach the uh, length of the Bannon, which is equal to 3n. What is important about this random walk is that in SOC 2016, Chakraborty et al. showed that if the added distance between two strings x and y is k, then the Hammond distance between the embeddings is between k over 2 and big O of k squared. Okay, so it's a low distortion embedding 
from the Eddy distance to the Hammond distance. How can you use this to develop a sketch? Well, if you think a little bit, this random walk on a string, actually, if you, if you have two strings, and if you consider random walks on them, it gives you an alignment between the two strings. Because when you advance in one string, but not in the other, it's like deleting letters from one string, okay? And uh, this alignment, it, it might be not the optimal alignment. It might be not the alignment of the minimal length, the, which is equal to the added distance. But it still gives you some information about an optimal alignment between the two strings. And if you repeat this scheme many enough times, then you will be able to figure out what the optimal alignment is. And this was what uh, Belusgi and Jean did in Fox 2016. They showed, you, they showed that if you take big of k squared independent random walks, random embeddings, random walk embeddings onto strings, and you compute the Hammond distance sketches on them, then you can decode the optimal alignment, the added distance between the two strings. Jean Nelson and Wu considered the exact same uh, scheme, but they performed a more careful analysis, and they showed the k-cube space for the k-time bounds for the sketch of uh, Bilusgi and Zhang. And then we added uh, one more idea to the sketch. We considered one embedding, one random walk embedding from x to mu of x, and we also sampled some compressible regions of the string, and this gave us the k-squared space k-cube time um, sketch for the added distance. So or you can use already these sketches to develop an algorithm for k, mismatch, for k added pattern matching. And the high, high level idea is exactly the same as for exact pattern matching and for the k mismatch pattern matching. You consider those prefixes of your pattern with exponentially increasing lengths, and you hope that once you have k added occurrences for a prefix of length 2 to the i, you can figure k added occurrences for the prefixes of length 2 to the i plus 1. Okay? Well, the main challenge is that we still have no concatenable sketches for the added distance. Okay? We have some sketches, but no concatenable sketches. So, but at least we have the same nice structure of k added occurrences. And this was shown by uh, Cherlampopoulos, Kochimaka, and Wellness in Fox 2020. They showed that if you have two strings, x and y, and the length of y is not much bigger than the length of x, then you have two possibilities. Either the number of occurrences, of k added occurrences, of x and y is small. And what you can do in this case, so you have found the occurrences of the prefix of length 2 to the i minus 1 in the text, and you want to check whether they are occurrences of the next prefix. What you can do, there is a few number of these occurrences. From each one of them, you can run an algorithm that computes the added distance sketch, and then you can use this added distance sketch to decide whether you can extend the occurrences of pi minus one to the occurrences of pi, okay? So this is an easy case. And you can also have the case where you have a very nice repetitive structure because you have many k added occurrences. These are the only two situations possible, the only two possibilities. And unfortunately, because you don't have concatenable sketches, you cannot make use of this structure directly. So we had to go through a, an extra step of introducing so-called uh, greedy encodings that allow to encode small distance alignments efficiently. And that allowed us to come up with a final algorithm. I know it was very fast, just uh, some, uh, to give you some taste of the algorithm. And uh, I will finish with something which is even faster. I will show you the main idea of the algorithm of Hatachari and Kutsky, just to show you, you how it is different from what we knew before. So what they did, instead of com computing this sketch based on a random fork embedding, they considered uh, an algorithm which decomposes the strings X and Y into blocks, and each block can be encoded in very little space. We call it a grammar encoding, but this is not very important. 
okay? And they showed that there is some decomposition which allows you to say that the added distance between two strings is equal to the added distance to the sum of the added distances between the blocks. And they also showed that actually you only have to care about those blocks that are different, okay? And that the number of blocks that is different is big O of K. Okay, so they have this, some magic de decomposition into blocks such that only K blocks are different and such that the added distance between the two strings is equal to the sum of the added distances between the different blocks. And that allowed them to develop sketches which, uh, which look like that. So they concatenate the encodings of the blocks into strings and then they build the K squared mismatch, so the sketches for the Hamming distance on top. Mm -hmm. And that actually allows you to compute the added distance between the two strings efficiently. How can you use these sketches in order to find the K added occurrence of a pattern in a text? Well, you can consider your text and you can encode it into, you can decompose it into blocks and encode each block as a grammar. And you do the same for the pattern. And then you run K squared mismatch pattern matching, but on grammar encodings of the blocks. And that's all I, pr I wanted to show you today. So let me just summarize. So if we want to solve this revariance of the pattern matching deterministically, we must use omega of M space. If we allow for probability and if we use some tricks from periodicity, then we can achieve log M space and constant time for exact pattern matching. We can achieve K space and square root of K time for K mismatch pattern matching and K squared space and K squared time for K added pattern matching. We don't know whether this log M is optimal space. So the true bound is somewhere between log M bits and log squared M bits. This space is in words. This one is optimal up to polylogarithmic patterns, uh, logarithmic factors. This algorithm can be probably be improved in terms of time per letter. So if you have any ideas about how to approach these open questions, we'll be very happy about it. Thank you for your attention.